everybody, welcome to another live stream uh, for the History Valley podcast as we take a stroll through the Valley of History. Today, Dr. M. David Litwa joins me, and we're going to be talking about his book, The Evil Creator. I have the link to the book in the description below. Welcome back to History Valley, Dr. Litwa. Hey, thanks, Jacob. Uh, mm -hmm. Good to be here. Um, I hope I don't appear too frozen. I look a little bit frozen from my end, <laughs> but am I coming well, through? Well, I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you pretty clearly. Okay. Yeah, I should mention that, uh, uh, and I'll mention this later too, but I've got uh, some extra copies of The Evil Creator. I know it's a pricey book. Uh, I'll send it to you directly uh, if you contact me uh, in Patreon or over Facebook. Uh, I'll beat the Amazon price. I, I hmm. want to make sure this book gets out there. Excellent. Okay, so my first question for you today is, um, what are the main differences between um, the Christian's view of the Creator and the Gnostics' view, uh, and the Gnostics' view of the Creator? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't address the question like that, Jacob, because for me, the Gnostics are Christians, and if you Put the question like that, you make it seem like the Gnostics aren't Christians. And of course, that's what the heresiologists want you to think. But we definitely should not think that. And that's the main point of my book called Found Christianities, which is a very accessible book, also a lot cheaper. And I take you through all the so-called Gnostics without ever having to use that term. Basically, all these are Christians, but they are rejected Christians. Um, not themselves, perhaps, but because their theories were rejected. So the idea of an evil creator is a, is a Christian idea. It's rejected by the present Christian minor, or majority, but that doesn't mean that in antiquity it wasn't a Christian idea. And in the time when that idea emerged, that was there was no orthodoxy. That is, it emerged in the early second century when there was no Catholic church, no church councils, no creeds, and no uh, actual statements of faith. Not quite yet, anyway. Um, so we're dealing with, uh, that's the basic framework for the question. Um, to answer it, uh, I think I would say something uh, like this. Um, I would go back to Plato. So Plato also had a doctrine of the creator. Okay. He believed that there was an ultimate high God called the good and that there was a lower creator who was sort of middle management working for the high God. And Platonism was in the early second century becoming very quickly the dominant philosophical current. And so Christians who were interested in being intellectual had to also deal with this current. And uh, Plato obviously is, uh, you know, 350 years before Jesus, um, uh, a good four to 500 years before the earliest Christian theology. And so we know that there were various options for for dealing with the creator, and it turns out that many Christians uh, decided that, yes, there was a creator, but that he's not exactly identical with the God of Jesus Christ, and or, or the, the father of Jesus Christ, I should say. There is a high God who is the father, and there's also a lower creator. But other Christians disagreed and said, no, uh, actually the creator is the high deity and so we're 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 not going to be platonic here we're going to uh take a thread that is mostly from the septuagint that is the old testament in greek and we're going to run with that thread and say that jesus his father is actually the creator now when you look at the gospels jesus never comes out and says when he's talking about his father that I that I you know I'm talking about the creator, um, so you don't actually know who he is talking about, but you can sort of intuit 
who he's talking about when you hear statements about the Father of Jesus Christ. And we know that the Father of Jesus Christ is a, primarily a good being as he is in as the as the high God is in Platonism, and that he is not jealous and wouldn't do evil or horrible things to people. And so that's basically uh, the view uh, that Christian philosophers took of the high deity, that he's incapable of doing evil. So when you come across instances, whether in the so-called uh, Old Testament, or more properly the Septuagint, or the, the New Testament documents, where the creator is depicted as doing acts of evil, then it becomes more and more clear that Jesus's father, who is ultimately good, is not the same being as the creator. And remember that the, that the creator in Isaiah 45, 7 says very directly, uh, to quote the Greek, uh, ego eimi haketizon kaka, I am the one who creates evils. And that creator is not compatible with the father of Jesus Christ, according to some Christians who were also, if you like, called Gnostics or knowers. I have a super chat question from Bob Dobbs. So thank you for the super chat. Where can, where can we say the Valentinians, Basilidians, Sethians, or Cainites disagreed with one another with regard to the ontological priority of various Platonic forms? Well, I appreciate the question, Bob, because I think you're thinking very precisely and accurately. It's very important not to just group all of these various Christian groups into one amorphous blob called you know, Gnostic or Gnosticism. All of these Christian groups are different. They all have different theological systems. They all have, uh, they all share a culture, but they are all significantly different in terms of their worship practice and in terms of what they believe salvation is, who Jesus is, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, we definitely can look at each individual sect, um, like the Valentinians, Vesladeans, and Sethians, and Kenites on a particular issue. With regard to this issue, uh, the ontological priority of Platonic forms, this is a good question. I think that, you know, for the Canites, we know so very little that it's impossible to answer for, for them. But we do know that certainly Valentinus and Vesalides were Christians who were interacting directly with Plato and Valentinus in particular identified the Platonic forms as what he called aeons or eternities in the mind of the father. And that these eternal, eternal beings, they never left the mind of the father. And that later Valentinians like Ptolemy thought of these eternities as separate beings outside of the mind of the father. And it was also said that Vasilides uh, believed in eternities. Um, that's by Irenaeus, and we should always be a, uh, a little bit careful of, of Irenaeus. Sethians don't, uh, Sethians also talk about eternities or aeons. Um, and it's never quite clear if they mean something like platonic forms, but they certainly have a theory of how the father God produced a mother God, Barbello, and then produced the self-born. And all of these can be thought of as aeons, and all of these can be thought of as a sort of Christian interpretation of the Platonic aeons and how of the Platonic forms and how those forms emerge out of the eternal thinking of God. So I think, you know, from what we can say, again, we can't say really anything about the Canaanites, but certainly the Valentinians, Sethians, and Vasilidaeans were Platonic enough 
so that they all theorized that there were eternal thoughts of God and that these pre-existed the world and that the world is modeled after these pre-existent eternal entities called aeons. I hope that goes some way to answering your question. We have another super chat from Constellation Pegasus. Thank you for the super chat. It's sad the 1611 KJV uses the word evil, but changes it later down the road. Yes, that's an interesting reflection. Um, the, the King James Version uh, obviously is, is Old English. And if you look in that King James of Isaiah 45, 7, um, you will see evils. So, but in modern, uh, I think the New Revised Standard Version um, says that the creator is the one who creates woe, uh, W-O-E, which is, um, yeah, I think not really helpful translation. Here's a, here's a good case where we haven't really improved matters. But the, the Greek behind it is kaka, uh, which is the plural of kakan, which means something evil. And um, the Hebrew behind it, uh, and, and normally English translations translate the Hebrew, is uh, uh, ra. Um, and this is the same word that you get in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so I don't find any reason why not to translate this word as evil in Isaiah 45, 7. There's a certain apologetic emphasis that wants to say, well, you know, the creator can't be the creator of evils. Uh, um, it just means he's the creator of like natural disasters like floods and um, earthquakes and hurricanes. Um, so those are just like, woes but they're not evil uh but then when you have to ask your question you know <laughs> well if the creator is in control of all and he still sends earthquakes floods and hurricanes is that not still evil <laughs> i mean the guy should be able to control that stuff right so that's the that's the major issue here of interpretation and as I say to everybody, to translate is to traduce. And that's why I encourage everybody here to uh, learn the original languages, because especially when, when, uh, when you have the phenomena of, of conservative evangelical translations, uh, like the NIV or the ESV, you're going to get apologetics in the translation itself. So obviously these Christian groups today don't want the creator being viewed as evil. So they'll translate certain words so that you don't think that. <laughs> but if you know the original, you're able to uh, basically circumvent this apologetic technique. So um, I just want to say real quick that I did understand uh, that the Gnostics are Christians. I understood that. And the reason I, in my first question, when I asked what were their views of the creator, I was just, I was basically asking, um, how do they view, what were the differences between the way the Gnostics and the Christians viewed the same deity? But I have a somewhat similar question because in page 98 in the book, um, you bring up uh, two gods, question mark, uh, 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 and 2 Corinthians 4.6. Uh, you quote these two verses and 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, the God of this world, and 2 Corinthians 4, 6, the God who said from darkness, light will shine. Now, I know some people interpret 2 Corinthians 4, 4 as suggesting, is it actually talking about the devil being the God of this world? Or some people say, oh, it's just God, it's God himself. How do, how do you look at this? Well, again, we need to go back to the original language. And the the Greek there is hatheos to ionos tutu. Um and there we get that word aeon again. Um, so it, it could be the god of this age or the god of this world. Um, and you just have to look at the usage of this phrase. So you go back into the Septuagint um, and other Jewish texts trans, uh, in Greek, and you see how this phrase is used. And I cite three instances of hatheos to ionos, 
and uh, outside of sec outside of Second Corinthians, and they all refer to the Creator. So I think that it's a modern apologetic attempt to say, eh, you know, the God of this world, well, that can't be the creator because the creator wouldn't be blinding people from seeing the light of Christ. So, aha, oh, that must mean the devil. But mm, think about it, okay? Uh, again, try to think like an ancient person would and use actual evidence so look back to, at the usage of the term. It's not used of the devil in the ancient world. And it would be highly odd if Paul referred to the devil as a god of this world. I mean, that suggests incredible power that only the creator would have. And he never does that anywhere else. So why would he do that here? Um, what the passage seems to be saying, and um, thinking in particular of Marcion's reading, is Marcion says, okay, in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, we have the God of this world. Okay, well, that's the creator, as most people know. I mean, the creator is the one who created the world. He has authority over the world, so he's the God of this world. Who else would that be? And then there's another God in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, who is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness. And so we've got a God who blinds people in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. And people should, you know, be opening their Bibles now and checking this out. Um, you'll see that there's a God who blinds people in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. That's obviously not a very nice thing to do, especially if you're blinding people from the light of Jesus Christ. Um, <laughs> that definitely does not seem like the Father of Jesus Christ. The Father of Jesus Christ is not going to blind you from seeing the light of Jesus Christ, <laughs> okay? But then there's this other God who's bringing light and shining it into our hearts so that we gain knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so, Marcion said, well, that must be the father of Jesus Christ because, you know, they're on the same team. And then there's another dude, the creator, who is not on the same team as Jesus. And that's the God who blinds. You also mentioned, and this is uh, page 102, that there's a different view about how Christ died instead of being killed by humans by crucifixion uh he's insinuated to have been killed um by a deity oh, I, oh yeah you were talking you were talking about marcion's view that Mar the, and the gnostics they viewed um the creator as the one who um had killed jesus in some way yeah, so ultimately the book is a kind of systematic argument, uh, I'm, or I should say part two of the book is a systematic argument going chapter by chapter, passage by passage, and showing you what might be called the Marcionite reception of certain biblical texts. So I look at 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, um, but I also look at 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 in light of 1 Corinthians 2 eight and nine, which says that it was, uh, you know, that the archontes or the archons crucified Jesus uh, because they didn't know he was the Lord of glory. Um, and if they knew that he was the Lord of glory, then they wouldn't have crucified him. So how do you deal with that. So you've got in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, you've got a God who blinds people from seeing the light of Christ. Well, that is the creator. And given his activity, that he seems to be an evil dude. And then you've got lower rulers effectively killing Christ. And then you sort of if you put on your Marcionite hat for a second, and you kind of scratch your head and say, well, okay, who's working for who, right? The creator is in charge of the world because he's the God of this world. 
but he's also got his own level of middle management, which are these lower archons or creators, or, or sorry, rulers. And these rulers are the beings sent out, presumably by the creator, to kill Jesus. But what's interesting is these rulers are ignorant of his actual identity. And if they knew who he really was, they wouldn't have made that mistake. So it, you're sort of reading com in comparison with texts that, uh, and sort of constructing a theology out of those texts. And I'm trying to show readers how a Marcionite would read those texts. Now, maybe it's it's how you've read those texts and you just haven't known that that was also Marcion's view, <laughs> which, you know, happens <laughs> to quite a number of people as, as they've told me as they've read my book. They're like, yeah, that's the way I thought it. And in the last chapter, I talk about, you know, you know, there's no reason to reinvent the wheel here, folks, because a lot of the people who have been seeing these problematic aspects of the Christian God are basically reading with Marcion, but they don't know who Marcion is. Um, and they don't know that he was so sophisticated. So they feel like they need to reinvent the wheel. But if we just go back to Marcion, he's essentially done the work for us uh, and has shown us uh, how he read and read quite logically and rationally to derive an evil creator from the Christian scriptures, right? So I, I do talk about the Septuagint, but it's primarily the Christian scriptures, the so-called New Testament, that is under the microscope. I just want to say real quick, the actual discussion of... Uh... Marcion's view of who killed Jesus is actually in page 148 and 149. However, page 102 kind of starts building up to that point. Um, we have a super chat question. Constellation Pegasus again. Thank you for the super chat. How much influence did Marcion have? Was it all Christians or just his local geographic location? Well, that's a great question. And the fun thing about Marcion is he is a traveler. Okay. So Marcion is born in Pontus, which is north central Turkey, um, south of the Black Sea. And he is active all throughout what is called Asia Minor or modern Turkey uh, in starting around 110, getting up into 120 and 130. And he then gets about 135, he then decides, you know, I'm going to be in the big leagues here and I'm going to sail to Rome. And at this point, Marcion is quite a wealthy man. And we know this because when he got to Rome, he made a humongous donation, um, which, uh, you know, got him very soon into the good graces of the church networks there and uh, basically set up uh, effectively a uh, a church of his own uh, or an assembly of his own that he met probably in his private house. And from this location, he uh, did, he published uh, the, his, his uh, Evangelion, what he called it, the, the singular gospel, which I think is a version of proto Luke. And he attached that to that uh, 10 Pauline letters. So he's, as many think of him, he is the creator of the New Testament. If the New Testament is a combination of Gospels and Pauline letters, he's the first one to actually publish them together under one cover. And he produces that, and uh, there's a series of arguments. And basically, the long and short of it is, Marcin creates his own independent community uh, and starts, again, getting on the move. Uh, we don't know where he goes after Rome, but we do know that his we have documentable evidence that Marcionite Christian groups were basically like Mormons or uh, Jehovah's Witnesses today. They were highly uh, interested in evangelism. And so by the late 2nd century, we've got attested Marcionite groups in North Africa, 
in Egypt, in Asia Minor, in Greece, in Italy, and in Syria. And in fact, in the Syrian area, they just completely take off. I mean, uh, and dominate in some areas like Edessa. So, um, and I, I like to tell this story, but I mean, in, in Edessa, interestingly, um, the, the Catholic Christians, they weren't called Christians, they were called Paludians. And the Marcionites were the, the group that was called Christians. And in the early fourth century, a bishop of Jerusalem writes to his community and he says that if anyone is coming to visit Jerusalem and asks for the Christian church, um, you know, be very careful uh, because um, chances are most people are going to lead them to the Marcionite building. Um, and so, <laughs> you know, when you are when you ask even in the fourth century, you know, who is a Christian? Well, in certain areas where Marcionites dominate, they were the Christians and they had almost exclusive uh, rights over that name. And it is only, you know, in our period where basically they've been um, apologetically kicked out. And which is why I always make a point to say, I'm not just talking about Marcionites, I'm talking about Marcionite Christians. That's what they called themselves. On page uh, 110, um, you write, according to Marcion's version, Galatians 3.10, as many as are under law stand under a curse. Now, What's, what makes me curious is, is do you think that, what, what do you think of Marcion's version of Paul's letters? There are some scholars that say, oh, his letters, his letters are shorter and his letters are more original. Some others will say, well, he was taking things out of Paul's letters. So his version of letters are later. What do you think about that? Well, here I can very happily recommend that everybody go get um, a book called The First New Testament by Jason Badoon. Badoon has done an incredible service to scholarship by publishing an English translation, his own um, reconstruction of Marcin's text. And he has a very helpful introduction. And I think Jason Badoon's work has significant, has basically exploded the idea that Marcin was an editor and that he was interpolating things and removing things. Um, by and large, Marcion thought that he didn't need to do that and that that would be inappropriate because these are scriptural texts. He did think apparently that the gospel had been polluted, but he didn't necessarily he, he didn't think that that was, but what, what he meant by gospel, that is to say, wasn't necessarily something written. So Marcion had his own gospel text, which he grew up with as a boy, which I'm calling Proto-Luke here, and that was the text that he was familiar with. And Proto-Luke never had certain things in the modern version of Luke, because the modern version of Luke is a text edited, combined with the Acts of the Apostles, and written, I think, after Marcin's main impact in Rome. And the reason why I think that, well, there's many reasons, um, but one of the, the major reasons is that there's absolutely not a shred of certain evidence that Acts was used prior to about 150. And I'm dependent on this, uh, for this argument on a very lengthy book by Andrew Gregory called The Use of Luke Acts, I believe. And uh, yeah, he, he basically shows that, that that wasn't used until about 150 that we can document. And so in all likelihood, it, it only appeared at that time. But by 150, Marcion is already had made his impact in Rome. So later, 
when Christians like Tertullian and Irenaeus got a ha got a hold of Marcion's New Testament, they noticed that yes, it was shorter. And they then accused him of editing out certain parts of it. But that's very unlikely because they had basically forgotten that Marcion was simply dealing with his own version of Proto-Luke. He didn't need to edit anything out. It was already shorter. So it's, it's not like Marcion, you know, got our modern version of Luke and said, oh my God, there's a birth narrative. Well, let me just take my scissors here and cut that out. No, it was never there for him in the first place. So he never needed to cut that out. <laughs> and this is what's really hard for, I think, modern Christians to understand is that in the late first and early second century, you know, what we think of as the New Testament and the Gospels and Paul's letters, they were material in motion. Um, there was no, there was no canonized version of any of this. I mean, frankly, there still isn't. I mean, <laughs> if you notice all the differences in the translations and in the manuscripts, we still don't have uh, an absolutely stable text. But certainly in the in the early second century, when no one had you know an agreed list, no one had you know an agreed uh, agreement about you know which which version was the true version. People just read locally what their versions were, as is logical in a world without a single Xerox machine or, you know, the World Wide Web. <laughs> you know, they just had handwritten documents that just moved around the Mediterranean. So that's the world that they're in. So you get local variants of these texts. And basically, Marcion brings his own local variant of Luke to Rome and publishes that with his own local variant of the Pauline epistles. And 50 years later, the heresiologists are like, wait a minute, this stuff looks different. And so Marcion must be, you know, playing fast and loose. Um, <laughs> but it's an apologetic argument, right? I mean, they've forgotten their own history, their own, their own textual history of what's going on. I mean, um, you know, they assume that Acts has been around for, you know, ever since probably the year 65, you know, but but it wasn't. <laughs> um, and the other thing to note is, is it's clear that the heresiologists are punching the air because they, as Tertullian, for instance, is going through Marcin's texts, he's con continually pointing out, well, you know, Marcin should have erased this bit because it mentions the Old Testament and quotes the prophets. I don't know why he didn't erase this bit, but he really should have. <laughs> and he does this several times. And that really shows that, Mar that Tertullian himself is confused why Marcion is such a bad editor. But you see that actually he is simply wrong in his theory because Marcion wasn't an editor and he left in, you know, dozens of references to the Old Testament, and he had no problem referring to passages in the Old Testament and referring to figures in the Old Testament like Elijah and Moses. He, yeah, that didn't contradict his theology at all. Marcin was a good reader of the Septuagint, and he used the Septuagint not as an authority, but as a sort of history book, which he could use to show you why the Creator was so bad. Yeah, another super chat question again from Constellation Pegasus. Thank you for your uh, thank you for your super chat. Did Marcion add text in Mark's last chapter, verses nine to twenty? Well, in my view, um, he did not, um, and he would have absolutely no reason to do that. Again, in my view, and I think that I'm basically in line with Jason Badoon. Um, First of all, um, Marcion did not consider the gospel called according to Mark to be canonical. He probably knew it, but he didn't consider it to be scripture. It wasn't published by him as part of his New Testament, so 
he would have no horse in that race and feel absolutely no need to add verses 9 to 20, which is the longer ending of Mark, or the, there's actually two different endings of Mark that are added. Um, and they are basically designed also to show that Jesus was physically, that is materially resurrected in his old physical body. And uh, Marcion, yeah, was not utterly on board with that. Um, he did think that Jesus was raised like other Christians, but he didn't necessarily pontificate on whether it, the substance of Jesus's physical body was this mortal flesh. You know, the, the stuff that decays and gets old and is subject to entropy by the, the laws of genetics. But that's another issue. Um, and uh, page 114, um, you talk about Ephesians 2.15, uh, and that we lack evidence of how Marcion's read it, but how Marcionites read it. But you also go on to say, we do, however, gain an important glimpse of Marcionite exegesis in Ptolemy's letter to Flora in the 130s or 140 CE. Ptolemy probably became a student of the Christian teacher Valentinus in Rome. There, Ptolemy eventually gained disciples of his own. So how does, um, how does this letter to Flora possibly help us understand Ephesians 2.15? Well, so Ptolemy and Marcion are contemporaries. And so even though nothing survives from Marcion's pen because it was all destroyed, you know, Marcion was the great enemy of the heresiologists. And they made sure that, um, you know, none of his independent writings and letters survived. But they did preserve one of the letters of Ptolemy um, and in that letter, Ptolemy is discussing basically his view of the Old Testament deity. And he says that basically he wants to choose a middle way. He says, well, I don't think that the God of the Septuagint is totally good because let's face it, he kills people and makes laws like an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I mean, are we really going to poke out your eye if you poke out somebody else's eye? I mean, we sort of know that that's not the way we do things. Um, but on the other hand, Ptolemy says, I don't think that the creator is entirely evil, like identified with the devil. Um, and that appears to be a subtle and subtly distorted reference to the Marcionite view. What Ptolemy tries to say is that the creator is actually a kind of neutral being who's just kind of ignorant, neither good nor bad, but on his own road of moral pro uh, progression. And what's helpful about Ptolemy is we see him not entirely playing fair, but still, um, we see him responding to Marcionite theology and saying, well, that's not me. You know, I'm not that crazy, or I'm not that extreme, and I'm presenting the middle way and the golden mean. Uh, but obviously, Ptolemy, by today's standards, you know, is not, uh, you know, orthodox either because he is very clear that the creator is not the father of Jesus Christ. And Ptolemy's position most closely approximates the Platonic position, where you have a good deity who is called the good, and then a lower creator who's sort of middle management doing the best he can, but sort of ignorant and not always very nice. Talk about that the that the Marcionites viewed Jesus as coming down to destroy the law. 
What do you think led them to that conclusion that Jesus came down to undo the Jewish law? Well, I think any reader of the Gospels would notice um, that Jesus is a, uh, he has a problematic relationship, let's say, with the Jewish leaders, and he doesn't like what they say, and he is often depicted as yelling at them. <laughs> For instance, um, in the episode of rubbing the grain on the Sabbath, where Jesus is walking through a field on the Sabbath and his disciples are picking heads of grain, rubbing them and um, chowing down. Somehow, you know, God knows how, there's a group of Pharisees in the field who are inspecting this and saying, well, you shouldn't be doing this because it's harvesting and it's against God's law to harvest, meaning the creator's law. And Jesus basically won't have any of it. I mean, he's like, oh, he's not like, oh, sorry, sir. Uh, we will stop doing that. No, he's like, no, you guys are the ignorant ones. They can do whatever the heck they want because David, don't you know, David on the Sabbath showed up at the tabernacle and ate the showbread, which is the bread dedicated to God. And, you know, <laughs> so this justifies my breaking of the Sabbath. I mean, he doesn't back down. He defends those who break the Sabbath. And uh, this text is, is in Marcion's gospel. And there's many others, you know, or Jesus heals, for instance, the, the bent over woman, uh, the man with the withered hand, all of on the Sabbath. And he seems to be very intentionally poking at the Jews and breaking the law. Um, you know, I mean, he could have chosen any day to heal these people. It's not like they weren't around on Friday or Wednesday. I mean, but no, I mean, he chooses this Sabbath <laughs> to like demonstrate that he can do work on the Sabbath. And then when people challenge him, it's not like he says, well, like you sometimes hear this from modern apologists. Well, my miracles, they aren't work. <laughs> no, I mean, he, I think he fully acknowledges that his miracles are a form of work. But um, what he says is basically, no, you're wrong. I'm working on the Sabbath and my father is working, as he says in John. And basically, I can do whatever the hell I want. Um, I mean, obviously, it's not that crass, but he, uh, it, it gets even more strong as you go on in Christian literature um, in, in the Gospel of John, where, yeah, he, he basically confronts people and orders them to disobey the Sabbath. So in the case of the man at the pool of Bethesda, he, he heals this cripple, and then it's a Sabbath, and and Jesus says, okay, we'll pick up this burden, your mat, and go walk. And so he does it, and it was a Sabbath, and it's illegal to carry a burden on the Sabbath. So, I mean, you got to be thinking to yourself, well, this guy just deliberately told another Jewish dude to break the Sabbath. I mean, is this guy not the biggest transgressor and lawbreaker you've ever seen? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, he's not coming down and he never says, you know, okay, folks. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I should say with the exception of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus never comes down and says, okay, folks, you know, I'm, uh, I'm going to um, just reaffirm everything Moses said. Um, and, you know, Moses had it right, and I'm just putting the finishing touches uh, on, on this. Um, no, I mean, he's continually hitting heads, and he's it continually at loggerheads with the law. And in the end, he is killed by the regulations of the law. Uh, because if you remember in the trial scene, which is probably entirely fictional, but it still tells us a lot about how Christians were thinking. 
in the trial scene, Jesus very coyly says that he is the son of God, son of the blessed one. And this is when the high priest tears his robes and he says, this is blasphemy. And according to Jewish law, according to the law of Moses, you can kill a blasphemer. And so this is the final process that leads to Jesus's death. So, I mean, technically, it's really not Roman law that Jesus is, you know, killed, is executed by. It's, it's Mosaic law. So the guy spends most of his life disobeying the law of Moses, and in the end, he's killed by it. Brown Pong, thank you for your super chat. Was the evil creator uh, Patel Ruta from Mandians? Well, I appreciate the question, Graham, but I can't answer that one um, because I'm not an expert in the Mandaeans. Uh, what I will say is that uh, the Mandaeans are a later, I would be comfortable saying that they are an offshoot of Christianity. Some would disagree with me. Um, and yes, they have their own cosmology and I think it's quite possible that they were in the matrix of second and third century theology and that they developed in, independently their own name for the creator. Um, and so you could be onto something, but since I'm not an expert, I'm not going to claim that I have a genuine clear answer to your question, but I'm happy to do further research. In the book, you point out that the epistle to the Ephesians is actually the epistle to the uh, Laodiceans, uh, or, was, or, or was originally the epistle to the Laodiceans. Why is it that a later editor revised Laodiceans and called it Ephesians? What do you think the point of that was? Well, I have to clarify something in your question because we don't know the original form. Um, all that we know is that in Marcion's collection of Paul's letters, what we call Ephesians, he called Laodiceans. And again, that was not because he changed it. I mean, he would have no, absolutely no reason for doing that. Um, but it's because that's simply what his version of that letter said. And so if we try to reconstruct what happened and we look at the manuscripts that we have, the manuscripts that we have um, sometimes leave the name of the church blank. So in some manuscripts of Ephesians, it says not, you know, grace and peace to you from Paul to the Ephesians, it says, grace and peace to you, to you who are in blank. And there's no city mentioned. And so what we think is going on is that this was, it's a pseudepigraphon. It's written by somebody later than Paul who wanted to use this as a circular letter. And what you would do with a circular letter is that you would bring it around to different cities and when you read it in different cities, you would just kind of fill in the name. Um, and that somebody filled in the name Laodiceans and that others filled in the name Ephesians, which isn't surprising because Ephesus um, by the late second century um, claimed that Paul had visited and we see this in Acts. I mean, it might be an entirely mythology. We don't know if Paul visited Ephesus for sure. But Ephesus was also a very big and powerful city. And it was the, um, the largest city in, in Asia Minor at the time. So it's, it's no mystery to me that eventually that reading in the manuscripts won out because Ephesians claimed that letter for themselves. We have another super chat. Bob Dobbs, thank you for your super chat. It seems somewhat common nowadays to portray a militant Dead Sea Scrolls style messiah. 
he did see Blessed. He said militant. Okay, militant Dead Sea Scrolls style Messiah that gets pacified by Romans when writing the Gospels. Anything in heretical accounts to back this up? Um. Well, I appreciate the question, Bob. Um, and um, you can send through any clarification. I th I think that you mean modern scholars tend to portray Jesus as a bit more um, violent historically than he's portrayed in the in the Gospels. Um, and again, if I'm not understanding that, just send through a clarification. Um, I think that that's basically not confirmed by anything we find in the alternative Christian material. Um, Interestingly, uh, you might, and you know, this is worth more research, but you might do a little bit more study of Marcion's view of the Messiah because Marcion had a very distinctive view. He, he believed that there was a Jewish Messiah and he believed that there was a Christian Messiah and he believed that those are two different people. So he believed that Jesus was the Christian Messiah and Savior, and he was the Prince of Peace. But he also believed that there was coming a distinct guy who was the Jewish Messiah, who would fulfill all of the prophecies that involved war and violence in the Septuagint or Old Testament, if you prefer. And... Uh, so yes, I think he was very honest in that respect because, you know, nowadays I think the apologetic tendency might be like, well, we're going to interpret, you know, when it says that the Messiah will smash the teeth of sinners, you know, in the Psalms. Um, well, that's just a metaphor, right? But Marcion was courageous enough and honest enough to say, no, that's not a metaphor. That's referring to something that will happen but it's a local Jewish Messiah who's not the real son of God. When I looked at the, when I studied the, uh, uh, the Ephesians and, and learned that the manuscript, that the, the earlier manuscripts uh, did not say to Ephesus, it was just to the saints. Is that because that the original letter was written to the entirety of the Christian community? Well, yes. So technically, and um, let's see, I've got my critical edition here somewhere, but technically, yes, it says to the saints who are in blank. Um, so I believe it's tis uh, hagiis tis usi blank. Um, so yes, I think that was very much intentionally written as a circular letter. Um, whether you think a circular letter is like a universal letter, I guess is a matter of interpretation. I mean, I think the thing to note is it's very different from the Pauline practice of definitely sending, you know, letters to distinct people or churches. Occasionally, Paul will say, you know, I, I want you to read this letter somewhere else. Um, but we never have the case where Paul is just sending out like a letter to all Christians. I mean, that's sort of like the Pope would today, you know, it's like, oh, I'm gonna send out an encyclical, it's just gonna be addressed to everybody in every city and all Christians or Catholics or whatever. That um, is definitely something Paul did not do. And that's another great indication that Ephesians comes significantly after Paul in a later age where that was possible would you say that ephesians 2 15 um would lean towards demonstrating that point since it says that christ destroyed the law of commandments by decrees and um uh and that would represent this later theology well i think it i think it does represent a later theology um but then the I think the real question is, um, you know, for Marcion, 
the Ephesians, or what he called Laodiceans, was part of his canon. So Marcion read this text as if written directly by Paul. And so as basically accurate. So I think we have to distinguish our modern historical critical critical reading where we say, eh, not likely. But for Marcion, that's he thought that Paul wrote Laodiceans, and he definitely thought that Paul wrote um, that Jesus destroyed the law. Um, and so there could be no clear evidence that Jesus was hostile to the law of the creator and therefore was also hostile to the creator who gave that law. Now, whoever actually wrote Ephesians, we don't know, but um, certainly it was a view that Marcion was very amenable toward. Ephesians seems to have seem to have a lot of influence on Marcion and the other Marcionites. Um, the Gospel of John, when it could they have misinterpreted uh, or looked or read into John uh, to support their views? Because I asked you about something like this before, involving verses like uh, John eight four four. Um, when it is, when it seems to, it says something very strange about. The Jews being, uh, or at least it's trying to portray the Jews as being of the devil or something close to that. And it seems to identify him as the first murderer. Or what about right. the sentence of David? There's two of them. And one well, is saying the error of God. Yes. Um, let me try to deal with that point by point. And and if, if I miss something, let me know. Um, so... This is another great thing about Marcion. So for Marcion, the Gospel of John isn't scripture. It's not canonical. It's not authoritative. So that text um, didn't influence him. Uh, <laughs> and it's another great indication that, yeah, I mean, Christians are reading different things and different, uh, different texts are authoritative. When the Gospel of John was written, probably in the early second century, when Marcion was a, a young man, um, other Christian groups did take that up, and we have documentable evidence that, yes, they read John 8, 44 as saying that, um, you know, which, if you don't know this text, it's Jesus polemically arguing against the uh, Jewish leaders, and I should say the fictional Jewish leaders, because none of this is really a record of what actually happened. This is all Johannine fiction. Okay, it's very important to understand. Um, but in this fictional debate, Jesus seems to basically lose his temper and just says, Humes ectu patros tu tiavalu, which um, would mean in the Greek, if you literally translate it, you, plural, are from the father of the devil. Um, but all English translations, at least you know those that I'm aware of, just translate this as you are from your father, comma, the devil. So, um, whereas in the Greek, we're led to imagine that there's the devil and the devil's father. In the modern English translations or mistranslations of this verse, uh, we're led to I'd simply identify the devil as the father. So, that's the point of interpretation. And it seems like Christian groups, including Catholic Christians uh, or early Catholic Christians, were perfectly aware of the ambiguity. And some Christian groups, yeah, were prepared to say, yeah, the devil has a father. 
And then when you ask, well, who's the devil's father? I would just say, well, same father as every, everybody else. It's the creator. And then when you look at what the devil's father does, that is, you know, lie and kill, according to John 8, 44, well, then he, he must not be a very nice, nice being. So that's how you get the evil creator when you're reading John. And also, I point out in, in the book that um, in John, Jesus refers several times to the ruler of this world. At one point, says that, you know, the ruler of this world shall be driven out. And, you know, nobody kind of taps him on the shoulder and says, oh, that's really cool. Well, well, who is the ruler of this world? Because it's so obvious. It, it's the same thing where, where you're thinking back in Paul, you know, the God of this world. Well, the God of this world and the ruler of this world is the same dude. It's the guy who made the world and therefore rules it. But that would be the creator. Is Jesus happy about this being? Well, evidently not, because... He shall be driven out. Now, other, you know, I mean, of course, I'm aware that, you know, <laughs> later Christian apologists, they all want you to think this is the devil, but you don't have to. There are reasons not to. And I show you why in the book. The Gnostics think that Jesus and the devil were brothers similar to the mormon uh viewpoint since jesus is the son of a higher deity and they do not think that he's the son of the jewish god but yahweh and the creator and the and the and the creator of the universe are two distinct beings but they were both created by that same being well if you're a reader of john eight forty four, you you can't think that um that is if you believe that there's a creator who then gives birth to a son who is the devil. That's going to be a different being than the father of Jesus Christ who begets a son. So they're essentially two different family trees. Um, and I think it's important to keep them distinct. Um, again, for Marcion, he doesn't, he definitely doesn't think the devil and Jesus are brothers um, because, again, a different family tree. Jesus is the son of the good father, whereas the Jewish Messiah is the agent of the evil creator. So they don't really have any relation at all. Julian says something that's in, is, that is uh, quite odd, and uh, different scholars have different opinions on what, what he means by this. Um, at one point he said, Marcion claimed to have written the first gospel, and then after that, after he had read the four gospels, the canonical gospels, he viewed them as plagiarisms of his own text, and he decided to publish it on his own. Now some, like... Um, uh, Dr. Matthias Klinghard thinks that uh, the Gospel of the Lord was not written by Marcion. What do you think about all this? Well, I think you're you're referring to and primarily to Marcus Vincent, who is a fantastic scholar. I know you've had him on the show. I really encourage everybody to go look him up and and read his stuff. It's very thought provoking, even if you disagree with it. Um, and then. Uh, Matthias Klinghart, yeah, just, we just have, well, it's been out for about, I don't know, six to nine months, I think, but he published this massive uh, recent edition of Marcin's Gospel, um, and it's two volumes, and he's got this very thorough comment, uh, commentary, and this used to be only available in German, and he's now updated it and got it in English, so Go check that out, everybody. It's great, great stuff. And yes, I think that uh, as far as I remember, so Vincent and Klinghart uh, agree on some things and they disagree on other things. 
Um, and I think that, you know, it's not all clear cut. Um, I, I don't have myself a very strong op opinion on, um, on Vincent's idea. I'm very, I'm very sympathetic to the idea that, yes, Marcion had um, a gospel text, and then when he he prior to publication, someone used that and changed them some things, and then he published this his sort of authorized version. Um, that's a very possible reading of what Tertullian is saying. Um, and if that's right, then it it's a great indication of, you know, one of the ironies of history. Because, of course, the heresiologists all want you to think that Marcin is the big bad editor who's like cutting and cutting things out and putting things in. But it, actually, Marcin thought that his, his enemies were doing that. And Marcin was probably right. I mean, when you think about, um, you know, the expansion of Luke and how it gets attached to Acts, you know, that's all, in a sense, in response to Marcion. And Marcion is alive as that's happening. So Marcion is alive to see, you know, his version of Luke expanded to become something that looks more like the modern versions of Luke. And you have to imagine you know, we don't have any direct and clear statement on this, but you have to imagine Marcion hitting his head against the table and saying that the real polluters of the gospel are these other people who are throwing stuff into it. And, of course, the great tragedy for Marcion is that his gospel is the one that's probably earlier, but that doesn't survive, and that the modern versions all go with this expanded version of Luke that's much more refined and polished and has got the birth narratives and, you know, longer episodes at the end, but a lot of the stuff added in from Matthew, that's the gospel that survives. And, you, I mean, you have to think that Marcin is utterly rolling in his grave and saying, you know, this, that's an awful, awful thing to happen. Um, and that in, you know, I mean, because from Marcin's perspective, that's a polluted gospel. That's, um, uh, that's a, a great tragedy. Now, I think Klinghart's view, um, in general, I, th I think his analysis of Marcin's gospel is great. And I would, again, I would encourage everyone to go read that. But I think Klinghart is ultimately too extreme because what he wants to say is that, um, you know, Marcin's gospel was, Marcin was actually a gospel writer and that he wrote the first gospel, and that all the four canonical gospels then originate from Marcion's gospel. Um, and I think that's going too far. Um, I, I really do. Um, but, you know, you can read Klinghart and make your own, own decisions. I don't find any strong evidence that Marcion ever stood up and said, yeah, I wrote my own gospel. I don't think that that's something that Marcion would do, because I think that Marcion is fairly traditional, and I think that by his time, there were gospels circulating, and he simply used the one that he knew. And I think he would be offended slightly at the idea that he could write a gospel, because Marcion didn't view himself as an inspired person or as, you know, uh, apostolic in any way. He viewed himself as a follower of Paul and wanting to preserve the Pauline gospel, which he thought was proto-Luke. So, um, yeah, it, the, I do, there's just a lack of evidence there. But, yeah, it, just to be clear, I would start, everybody who's interested in this question, I would start with Badun, First New Testament, and then I would go to read Klinghart and Marcus Vincent because Klinghart and Marcus Vincent, they're, it's really involved heavy style scholarly reading. So you need to be really mentally prepared for that. But definitely go check it out. And I should say that I've got a lot of material on Marcion on my Patreon. And I've also got, uh, since we're coming close to the end here, I, I've also got a new YouTube channel, which uh, I will be slowly putting material on, including 
um, material on Marcion. Uh, so if you're really interested in this topic and on the evil creator in general, let me know. And I also have, uh, I believe, two copies of the evil creator on my shelf that I can send out. Um, it would be great if you join me on Patreon, then, you know, you can just send me your address privately and, and I can send you the book. Uh, I will beat the Amazon price. Um, and yeah, uh, I, because I know it's pricey for people. I want to get it into your price range. So I think, yeah, we can negotiate, you know, 50 US dollars. I can send you the hardback which I think saves you at least 50 US dollars. Um, and uh, yeah, I can sign it if you want. I'll get it straight to you in the mail. So I really appreciate all the interest and especially those people who are on the super chat and uh, well, well, other people as well who are, who are, not, who are just chatting. I uh, really appreciate your interest. We actually have a couple of more super chats to look at just real quick. Stephen, yeah, a storyteller, sure. thank you for your super chat. If Marcion followed Serto and Serto followed Summit Magus, would the idea of the evil creator originate from Summit Magus? Well, that's a great question, Stephen. Really appreciate it. Um, I mean, essentially, though, we have to be very wary that we don't fall into the heresiological trap because it's Irenaeus who creates the story that Simon is the sort of proto-heretic, that he's the, the father of all heresies. And um, so he wants to make you think that Simon is, you know, the first to create a sort of Gnostic theology. The fact is, we don't know. Uh, we really, really don't. And and I someday, hopefully before I die, I want to write a complete monograph on Simon of Samaria because it's so important to get to the bottom of what we can actually know about Simon and about Simonian Christianity, which I think really did exist, but it's not necessarily what you get when reading Irenaeus and the heresiologists. So the trajectory of the evil creator, I would put it Christians coming up with the evil creator idea in the early second century with Marcion and the Sethians as the main representatives. Cardo, I wish we knew more about him. We really don't know anything about him. Um, but if he also derived the idea of the evil creator, then that would document that it's present in early second century Syria. And that Marcion is the one who took the idea to Rome. Um, so that's, I think, what we can say. Next one. So, Beck Lord uh, of the Four Corners, thank you for your super chat. Um, Hip Hop has Kanye. We have Dr. Litwa, Kari. Hmm. Kyrie. Yeah. Hello, Jason. Good to see you. I don't listen to Kanye, but um, <laughs> I'm happy to have the Kyrie. I send it right back to you. Karis Kairini. So here's my final question for you. Um, do you think that the idea that Yahweh being the evil guy, Jesus being the son of a different deity, did, did that originate from around the time of Marcion? Or do you think that idea actually existed for a while before Marcion and he just adopted some version of it? Well, it's tough to tell, but I think Marcion is fairly original. Um, but you also have to take into account Egyptian Christians, many of whom we don't know their names. Um, I mean, we know Vasilides and we know Valentinus, but I think there were even earlier Egyptian Christians who were looking at native Egyptian theology and saying, um, you know, we are Christians, and for years and years, the Egyptians have been saying that Yahweh is a form of the god Set, and Set is the Egyptian evil deity. So it was a, a very natural for these Christians to say, well, yeah, the, the creator was, was evil, but that's not our god. Our god is, is entirely good. 
the entirely good be father of Jesus Christ. So in a sense, the, the path had been prepared for them, but they made the innovation and made the connections. So I, I think that Christians who believe in the evil creator, basically uh, they, they come at it from multiple grounds and it's not like it pops up in just one area. It's in Egypt, it's, it's in Syria, it gets its way to Rome. But, and I think all these people are probably in conversation with each other to a certain extent, but we no longer, historically, we don't have enough evidence to say who's talking to who, when exactly. Let's take a look at this final super chat before we close out. So big again, thank you for your super chat. Thoughts on Christian references and books in Lucian, specifically a true story and passing on Peregrinus. Well, geez, a lot can be said about this, Jason. Um, I mean, again, I, I think everybody should read Lucian just because he's 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 incredibly funny. Um, but a true story, yeah, uh, probably uses at least one Christian um, text, um, which is the Apocalypse of Peter, which is very popular in second century Egypt. That one survives in uh, Ethiopic, and you can you can check that out today even. Um, I love Peregrinus, Passing of Peregrinus, that's, uh, that's got to be the funniest text, um, I think. Well, I mean, it's, it's, you sort of, you know, it's either Peregrinus or uh, Alexander of Abinotakos, you know, just uh, takedowns. But what's interesting about Peregrinus is he is a Christian, or he becomes a Christian leader, and Lucian says that he was even writing Christian texts in the, in the uh, you know, in the second century. Um, he was a Christian leader in Palestine, and um, that he he did something which offended his community and sort of got kicked out, and that's when he went down to Egypt and um, <laughs> did all sorts of funny things like expose his penis in public and all all you know, wonderful things like that. Um, but yeah, the, the real interesting question is, well, geez, what does Lucian know about Christianity? And we'd really like to know, you know, what are the Christian texts and who are the Christians he knew to tell those stories? Um, gosh, it would be great to have him here um, in a time machine um, because, yeah, we we are just missing so much. And uh, But this is the journey. This is where we are. This is why historical reconstruction takes so much work. And it's why I encourage everybody to really get up to speed on the scholarship. Uh, obviously, don't believe everything you read. Evaluate it for yourself. And um, yeah, make your own decisions. But make sure you're reading the good stuff. Well, thanks for joining me again, Dr. Litwa. Excellent. Right. Yep, happy to be here. And I thank everybody that has super chatted their questions. It helps me continue this channel. And I thank everybody else that participated in the live chat. And I will see all of you later for two live streams tomorrow. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.